Okay, I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me a chance to come here and talk a bit about uh, what information I've been able to get out of a few transcriptomes to tell me about what's going on in tropical diversity. So this is a map that's been put together of species richness for plants. Um, and you can see from this that species richness is highly concentrated in tro tropical regions. So trying to understand um, the reasons behind the patterns of plant diversity should definitely involve studying this diversity in tropical regions. And these are two of the plants that we've been working on recently. Um, so this is a, a typical begonia, not maybe the sort of typical begonia that you'd be familiar with, but a horrible little pink and red bedding things. This is what they look like in the wild in the native environment, much nicer. Still not beautiful though. Um, <clears throat> These are short-lived herbs. Um, they live in sh generally in shade and damp habitats. Um, and there's over 1,500 species. Every time somebody goes out into the field, they fall, find more begonias. There's a lot of them out there. And the other group that we've been working on is the ingots. So Toby mentioned these earlier. And this is part of the collaboration with him and a number of other people. And these are legumous trees. Um, they're much in fixers. They grow in well-drained open forests. And they do have some commercial uses being grown as shade trees for um, coffee plantations, and some of them produce edible seed pods. So first I'll talk, talk to you a bit about the begonias. <coughs> so, so I showed you one of the sort of typical wild begonia species, um, but they're very diverse. This is begonia parvifolia, which is um, found in Brazil. And uh, he's not an incredibly small man. He's a normal sized man, he's just an incredibly big plant. And it's huge inflorescences. And um, <coughs> they're uh, really scary looking plants. And this, in contrast, is Begonia bognari, which is from East Africa. And if it wasn't in flower, you'd think it was a grass or something like that. They have these very narrow little leaves, no lateral expansion at all. And it's only the very typical Begonia flowers are the complete giveaway that this is a Begonia. So when I first started um, working at the botanics, I, this is what just amazed me, that there was so much diversity in the genus. And I wanted to look at what was the genetic background behind this diversity, particularly in leaf shape. And to help me understand that, um, we made a few transcriptomes. So what I did was we took um, vegetative buds about this stage. So there's a developing leaf that's actually just about to start expanding, but all the important bits are there. And then these stipules here are covering over where another leaf is, its, apical, its axillary meristem, and then another leaf from the shoot apical meristem. So about three leaves in different stages on the shoot apical meristem. Uh, we extracted RNA from these stages from three different species, uh, Plebja, Venusta, and Contrifolia. Now, Plebja and Contrifolia are very closely related. This is a phylogeny that you don't need to see the details on, you just need to see the colors. Uh, this is Contrifolia and Plebja here, these two little red blurs together. And uh, they're both from Central America. Plebja is a bit more widespread, Contrifolia more limited around Panama. Um, Venusta is down here. It's in a, uh, the other sort of radiation of begonias. So this is South American begonias. This is uh, Southeast Asian begonias. And basal, you get some African begonias. So they're these two major radiations of begonias. And Venusta is in there as an example of the Southeast Asian radiation. Um, because the, the transcriptomes were um, very similar in sequence, I actually assembled them all together initially and then um, used bowtie to map the reads from each individual species onto the, um, the triscriptome, the, the three transcriptomes put together. And this gave me a set of uh, 17,500 genes that had reads from each individual species, which is not a bad set for, for begonia genes, but there was a fair number of genes here um, that seemed um, distinct to individual species. And part of that is because the transcriptomes are, by their nature, partial. These are 454 transcriptomes, so there's not a huge depth of sequencing. So there's certainly some things that just by chance we've picked up in one species and not the other. Um, so to look at the patterns of uh, evolution in, within each individual spe species, one of the things we've done is uh, analyze the ratio of synonymous and non-synonymous changes in paralogous pairs of genes within each species. So you've got gene duplication happening all the time, and when a gene duplicates, you're going to start the clock on accumulating um, synonymous changes independently in each paralogous pair. And these, these, the, the, num 
the proportion of synonymous changes is, is going to increase gradually over time. So what we've done here is identified all the parallelogous gene pairs in each individual species, and then used panels to calculate out the KS values for those individual genes. And what you can see is a very similar pattern for all the different species. So there's quite a number that have um, very few uh, synonymous changes, so these would be um, very recent duplications. And then what should be happening is you should be having sort of a slow decrease down like this. Um, but that's not what you get. You actually get a very clear second bump in each of the individual species. And this, is, uh, and this second bump is about KS 0.5 for all of them. And this is the indication of a whole genome duplication that has happened. So at some point back in the past, the whole genome duplicated. Uh, you had a vast number of parallelogous pairs with very little changes, and this has moved through the graph that way as time has gone on, and they've accumulated more and more changes. And this is the signature of that. Um, and since it's in all of the three, pair, three species, and these three species last share a common ancestor way, way back, um, probably about 30 million years ago, the dates for begonia um, radiation have uh, got rather large confidence limits on at the moment. So maybe about 30 million years ago, um, there was this whole genome duplication at the very base of begonia. And I think this has probably been important in begonia evolution because it's given an awful lot of material for natural selection to get its teeth into. And one of the projects we have going on in the lab at the moment, I have a new PhD student, um, Katie Emilianova, and she's looking at the patterns of uh, what's going on with these paralogous pairs, which genes are being particularly con conserved, which genes are showing strong signs of divergent radiation, to see what are the sort of evolutionary pressures these lineages have been under. So, other things we've been able to do with the transcriptome. Um, We've used it to make a genetic map, and this was one of the um, drivers behind me doing the transcriptomes in the first place, because I wanted to make a genetic map to allow me to do some really nice interspecific genetics in Begonia. And coming from a developmental genetics background, I wanted to look at all my favorite genes in Begonia. And the, the cheapest way of doing this turned out to be to do some transcriptomes. So what we've done here is this is Lepka and Contrafolia, and they weren't just picked um, sort of randomly for the transcriptomes. They were picked because they make a fairly fertile F1, and this gave me the ability to go ahead and do the map. So we've got the F1 between these two, back crossed it to Plebja, back crossed it to Contrafolia, made mapping populations in each direction of about 200 plants. And then we went through the transcriptomes and picked out interesting genes, genes that were interesting to us that I wanted to know about. Um, we used those to pull out SNPs in developmental regulators. And we got about 100 SNPs that we genotyped in the mapping populations. And of course, this wasn't enough to give a good map density. So we backed this up with a whole bunch of AFLPs. So there's uh, $200 AFLPs in the back cross to Plebja and $100 AFLPs in the back cross to Contrafolia to give a bit of density and weight to the map. And this worked out quite nicely. We've got a mean marker distance of 3.6 for Plebja, back cross and the mean marker distance of uh, maybe six centimorgan for the contrafolia back cross. And this is perfectly sufficient to do one of the other things I really wanted to do with map, and that's to do QTLs for interspecific differences. So uh, one of my PhD students, Rubina Shafat Ali, she took the mountain population and phenotyped it for 141 traits, which took her a long time, and just made a very, very impressive database. And We've been QTLing those traits and finding, out, finding a number of QTLs. Some of the things that I was really keen to get QTLs for, like photosynthetic efficiency, we weren't able to identify a nice clear peak. But some of the things that are very intriguing about begonia, we have been able to find clear peaks for. For example, begonia is odd in that it clusters its stomata. Many of the species that cluster stomata are going from you know, two up to five or six or even seven. And this varies in the number per cluster across the leaf. Um, there's some species that don't do clustered, but there aren't many other genera around out there that do clustered stomata. So this is an odd phenotype, and we've got a nice clear QTL for it, and uh, we're hoping to do a bit more work and establish what actually is the locus underneath this QTL that's controlling how many stomata you get developing in a cluster. And this is a really key uh, functional trait for the begonias as well, because one of the things that's variable between these two species is the dryness of the habitat that they live in. Contrafolia lives in definitely wet, moist environments, deep in the forest, very shady, 
Perpetua lives in much drier environments, probably not quite the seasonally dry rainforest that Togo was talking about earlier, but certainly nowhere near as wet as um, Contrafolia. And some of the Perpetua um, populations actually become deciduous sometimes of year. So they'd be better adapted to water stress. And obviously, clustering as tomato is something that's going to affect how the plants deal with water. Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out on this map is that uh, because we've got back crosses to Contrafolia and to Plebja, uh, all of these maps, all of the map is actually of matching chromosomes for Contrafolia on this side and Plebja on the other. And one of the things we were worrying about when we were putting the map together is, is this going to work because it's an inspecific cross and it might just be a hideous mess out there if there's been a lot of variation between species. And you can see from this that it did work. It's not a hideous mess. There's a few, few crosses over. Um, yeah, this kind of thing here, where one marker jumped in position between species. But in general, the order of markers is very nicely conserved. Right, so having got these big data sets of what genes are expressed in three different begonia species, um, all from exactly the same sort of stage, from these vegetative birds, I then started um, digging through them in a more bioinformatic way to try and see what genes are differentially expressed between begonia species. And uh, this wasn't as straightforward as I immediately assumed it would be. I thought, oh, well, you know, you've got your transcript, don't you just look what's on, what's not on. But as I mentioned, they're 454 transcriptomes, they're partial, and there's plenty of genes that are present in the data set from one species and missing in another just because of random chance. So the way I've come up with this list that you see here on the left is I've pulled out sequences that have over 100 reads, so they're fairly highly expressed, in the Gonian general. So if they're on the species, they ought to be on in all three. They ought to be pickable. Pickable? Detectable, that's it, in all three. Um, I'm not looking at really low-level transcription factors here, which is a pity because they could be really interesting, but then they're part of the set. And out of those sets that have got over 100 reads altogether, uh, more than 90% of those reads should be from one species only. So I'm looking for things that are primarily expressed just in one species. So it's not totally unique, it's almost unique species. And we've got 96 of those species, uh, 29 mostly Contrafolia, 15 mostly Plebja, and 51 expressed mostly in Venusta. And rather than list all 96, what I've done is I've gone through, pulled out the Go terms that each of those sequences have been annotated with by comparison to a Arabidopsis sequences, and just made a list here and coloured it up since you don't have to squint and read all these things here. So I was expecting a fair number of disease and herbivore response genes to be differentially expressed between species, and I do get a few of those come up. Um, I get quite a lot coming up in secondary synthesis, which could be related to the disease and herbivore response, or and some of them are certainly involved in differential regulation of the anthocyanin pathway between the gonias. Um, Nicely for my, my sort of general interests, uh, I do get a number that are involved in development, so photomorphogenesis, um, response to the absence of light, so photomorphogenesis, I suppose, response to mechanical stress, uh, photoperiodism, so there are key developmental genes that are different between the species. And rather to my surprise, we get a fair number of genes involved in photosynthesis, uh, genes that are part of the complex with Rubisco, um, genes that are involved in photosystem II um, stabilization, photosystem one light harvesting proteins. These things I thought would be fairly fundamental and wouldn't change much between species uh, do seem to be changing between begonia species. Now, one of the difficulties that I'd run into with doing these comparisons comparisons between the transcriptomes is trying to identify paralogs really robustly in orthologs. Uh, it became a bit of a nightmare and in order to get around it we took a rather sort of I suppose expensive solution which was trying to make a draft genome of begonia and it's been really really helpful. Um, it's helped by the fact that begonia doesn't have an insanely big genome. Well the ones we're working with, Pledger and Contrafolio, have got quite reasonable sized genomes. The new has actually got a genome twice the size of the others so I suspect this is a recent duplication because we don't see the signal of this in the transcriptome. This, gene, this genome duplication must be so recent that uh, uh, this was, the assembly was done with Nubler. Nubler must be assembling the two paralogs together into the one context. So I don't get double number of contexts from the list of the and Contrafolia. The polymorphisms are reasonable. They have to be good to be able to do the mapping. Um, so we've got a draft gene that made of Contrafolia because from the transcriptomes, we knew this was the most homozygous of our three possible species. Um, this was done by the gene pool, they did a CLC assembly and got a large number of scaffolds. 
this is very, very darkly genome. But it doesn't matter because we're using it mostly in order to deal with uh, padlocks. Um, I'm not trying to draw pictures of the whole chromosomes of begonia. And the N50 is a reasonable size, so uh, for any, any transcript of interest, you can probably get a fair bit of the 5' prime and maybe some of the 3' prime if you're lucky. So it's useful to us. Um, this genome does seem to cover fairly well. Um, we've got about 18,000 genome contigs that match the transcriptomes, and this number is sort of similar to the number of sequences in our transcriptome sets that have reads from all different species. So those are sort of nice, reliable genes we can work with. About 10% of the genome is close to a blast hit in the cucumber transcriptome. Cucumber is the closest species to begonia with a sequence genome. Uh, it's not very close, is it? but uh, it's got a sequence genome, so that's the size we go with it. And about nearly 40,000 of the orbs in the genome have got blast hits to tear. And these blast hits identify 26,000 unique Arabidopsis genes. So we haven't got all the begonia genome here necessarily. We probably haven't got all genes, but we've got most of the coding genes. So a nice working draft. Um, another extra thing that we've work, been working on recently is we've been able to get a fourth transcriptome to add to our set. And this is through a collaboration with Frederick Lenz of Leiden and Andrew Groover at UC Davis. Uh, Frederick is interested in the development of secondary woodiness in lineages that aren't, um, aren't originally woody. Some of them will start producing sort of shrubby-like or small tree-like species, particularly on islands or in isolated places. And he'd heard about some of these begonias that develop, it's exaggerating to say trees, but I was talking to Andrew the other day there, and he reckoned there was no dividing line between shrubs and trees. You could just pick where to put it. And so I'm going to call this a begonia tree, which is quite impressive. It's, this one here is about, oh, six foot tall. Um, and the wood it makes is hard enough just to fit things with. So, and this is a cross section that uh, Frederick did, so you can see his proper secondary thickening here. And Frederick um, went out to Borneo to collect uh, tissue in the field that he sent to me, and I extracted RNA from the herbaceous sections up here and from the woody sections down here. And we did a comparison, and we get a number of interesting genes, like perianthia, which is a BZ transcription factor, some expansins, sided looking into transferases, various things that sound as if they really should be the sorts of things that would be upregulated in uh, where you're getting the secondary thickening. And we're going to do a lot more work with this set of transcriptomes by comparing them to uh, transcriptomes of lignifying <laughs> poplar tissue, lignifying. Um, eucalyptus tissue to identify genes that are unique to this type of secondary wood production uh, and genes that are conserved between uh, the different types of wood production. So the last bit about looking at the transcriptomes was we went through the, um, actually Katie Milanova ran all the begonia uh, transcriptomes through panel for me and having this extra data point from Bibibidia, the shoddy begonia was really useful. So now we could do comparisons of um, the number of synonymous, the ratio of uh, non-synonymous and synonymous changes for, par for padlocks between Contrifolia and Venusta, Contrifolia and Plebgia, and Birbidgia and Venusta. And this is nice because I mentioned Contrifolia and Plebgia are very close. They're probably separated only by a few million years. Birbidgia and Venusta are a bit more distant. They're probably separated by five to six or seven million years. Whereas Contrifolia and Venusta is looking at the contrast between the South American radiation and the Southeast Asian radiation. So they're very different time periods. But what I thought was odd when I went through the lists of genes that had a KN to KS ratio of more than one. So these are accumulating more non-synonymous changes than synonymous changes. These are diversifying genes. Um, but there aren't huge numbers of them, but of those relatively modest numbers, a uh, very high proportion of them are uh, annotated as being chloroplast localized or involved in chloroplast fun function, or just have the go term chloroplast attached to them. And this is in comparison to the orthologous pairs altogether, where you're looking at maybe sort of 5 to 10 percent annotated with uh, chloroplast go terms. And some of these chloroplast genes are really quite interesting. So um, one of them is cyclophilin 320, which functions in the repair of photo damage. Um, system 2. And one is a PSBQ3, which is right at the oxygen evolving um, complex in uh, photosystem 2. It's right there where the water is being split. So it's a very critical area and an area very prone to damage. And what I think might be going on with this uh, 
focus in begonia diversity on uh, photosynthetic genes and genes of plant is due to the environment they're growing in. So this is uh, a photo that Mark Hughes took of a begonia species I can't remember the name of in Southeast Asia. And it shows the sort of dim conditions that they're usually growing in, but if you look in the background, you can see all these little speckles of light. And those would be the sunflats, which is a very high intensity light that has made it down through the canopy. So begonias usually have to be adapted to be able to photosynthesize and grow in basically in the dark. And their, their photosynthetic capacity is rather low. Um, sometimes it's difficult to detect the anything at all. But they've also got to be able to deal with really intense light without it blowing their photosystems completely apart. So I think this has been a strong selective pressure and that the different begonia species have come up with different solutions to it. Oh gosh, sorry, I'll have to speed up a little bit. So that's where I've got to with the begonia stuff. Our ongoing work is going to be concentrating on what's going on with the chloroplast localised genes and looking at them in a bit more detail. Um, we've already started some ecophysiological work with um, um, Mabina's work with some of the traits that she measured are ecophysiological traits. Um, and we're hoping to f do further localization of the QTLs and more work on the wood formation. And I mentioned Katie's stuff on gene duplication. And this will have to be the end. That's really unfortunate. <laughs> I have the other half about Ingers. Oh, well. Can I go quick, quickly? Okay. So th I'll have to do this extra quickly. But Toby's already told you about Ingers. And they're, they're very interesting. Uh, they're very diverse, lots of them, but they. The, sorry. They're diverse and there's lots of species, but they look very much the same. And the places that they're diverse is actually in their response to herbivores. They have, make a really huge diversity of chemicals, and there's no phylogenetic signal when you compare the, the, the variation of different chemical assemblages in the leaves to their phylogeny. So that it's not driven by phylogeny. And we're collaborating with uh, Phyllis Colley and Tom Kusa in Utah, and uh, Graham Stone and James Nichols in Edinburgh um, to understand the diversity of Ingers and to see how it's driven by their response to herbivores. So uh, Phyllis and Coley are looking at the biochemical um, analysis of the Ingers leaves and working out all these sort of very strange secondary chemicals they make. Uh, Graham and James are going through their bugs and insects and caterpillars that have been picked off the Ingers plants and uh, I'm looking at the sequence and expression diversity, and this has all been done in the phylogenetic context as guided by Toby. And this is just a really nice picture of Tom, Tom Kersa out on Barakaloroda Island, uh, harvesting leaves for me to extract RNA from. And he's going, he cuts them in half, he takes half to chemical analysis, I take half to RNA analysis. And when I've done RNA analysis, I get an awful lot of secondary synthesis genes. Again, you just have to look at the colours here. Everything in yellow is a secondary synthesis gene, and these are genes that are highly differentially expressed between species. And I think I'll just have to leave it at that, yes? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you.